Okay, hi everyone. This is Casey Swegman again. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So, just to introduce myself, I'm the project manager of the Forced Marriage Initiative at the Tahare Justice Center and want to thank you all for joining us today. We had a huge response to this webinar, so hoping that it is as informative and useful as we think it will be to the field. The webinar itself is part of a quarterly series put on by the National Network to Prevent Forced Marriage at the Tahare Justice Center. And the Tahare Justice Center is a national nonprofit organization working to protect courageous women and girls fleeing violence through direct legal and social services, public policy, advocacy, training, and education. And before I start the webinar and introduce our guest presenter, I just want to go over some quick housekeeping points. First, we will be taking questions and comments from the audience during this presentation. And the way that you contribute questions is by using the question function on your GoToWebinar software in the sidebar on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're seeing a truncated or mini sidebar, all you need to do is hit the little orange arrow. It will pop out and you'll see an option to type into the question box. We will be monitoring that during the presentation and taking moments to pause and share comments and questions with our presenter. And so we really do encourage you to please contribute to the conversation and let us know your thoughts. We will be recording this webinar and it will be available on our website, preventforcemarriage.org, or it will be a part of our searchable resource library, along with past webinars and training material on forced marriage in the US. And very, very important to me is that we will be sending out a brief evaluation survey at the conclusion of this webinar, which includes an option to be added to our referral list in case we are ever looking for client resources or case collaborators in your state or where you practice. So I really do hope that all of you will take the three minutes or so to fill out the evaluation as we are always looking to expand the network of folks engaging on this issue and serving survivors. So now I'm really excited to be welcoming our guest presenter who is Lisa Martin. She is an assistant professor of law at the University of South Carolina School, uh, School of Law, where among many other things and collaborating with us and us taking up a lot of her time, she is teaching their new domestic violence clinic. Professor Martin's teaching, scholarship, and practice focuses on issues relating to domestic violence, family law, poverty, and access to justice in the U.S. and abroad. And prior to joining USC, Professor Martin taught at the Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law, where she co-directed the Families in Law Clinic, supervising students representing people who had experienced domestic violence in emergency protection order, family law, and immigration cases, and undertaking systemic reform and community legal education projects. Before joining Catholic University, Professor Martin taught international rights of women as an adjunct professor at George Washington University Law School and managed the teen dating violence program at Women Empowered Against Violence, which is also known as WEAVE, where she represented teenagers experiencing dating violence and worked to reform laws and policies to increase legal protections for teens in the District of Columbia. Her published articles include What's Love Got to Do With It? Securing Access to, teen to Justice for Teens, which evaluates the accessibility of civil protection order remedies to minors subjected to domestic and dating violence in all 50 states and DC. And her recent publication, and the one that we are so excited to learn more about, Restraining Forced Marriage, is available on our website, and that is what she is here to talk to us about today. And so without further ado, Lisa, I am going to share the controls with you, and hopefully you will be able to move us along. Thank you. And um, first, I want to say thank you to you, Casey, and all of your colleagues at Tahire, and for Tahire as a broader organization for hosting this webinar, and to all the participants for joining today. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to share my research with you, um, and who may be able to put it into practice. So thank you for being here. Thank you. I am testing now if I can move the slides, and I can. Great. So um, before diving into um, the main legal focus of the webinar today, I just want to start with some background on the phenomenon of forced marriage itself. And Tahiri and many other organizations working on this issue define forced marriage as one that takes place without the free and full consent of one or both parties. A lack of consent can be caused by an individual being younger than the legal age to marry, subject to some incapacity or disability, and most commonly in Tahiri's experience, when a person is subject to force, fraud, or coercion. 
And consent here means to the timing of the marriage as well as the person you're to be married to. It's important to distinguish between agreeing to the idea of getting married someday and free and full consent as it relates to the marriage process, timing, and partner selection. And it's also important to recognize a distinction between forced and arranged marriage where family and parents may play a role in helping to find a match and planning a wedding, but the ultimate choice over whether, when, and whom to marry remains with the individuals involved. And Casey, I am having a little trouble um, moving the slide, so maybe I can ask you to take that back over. Did that work? Yes, it did, thank you. Okay, so this is not to suggest um, that arranged and forced marriages are always totally unrelated, um, nor that distinguishing between the two is always clear cut. The central difference is consent, which may be more of a continuum than a black and white calculus, as this image, I think, helps demonstrate. So a key question that often comes up with regard to this issue, which is one that I myself thought of when I first um, started talking with Tahere about this problem is, does forced marriage really happen in the United States? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, forced marriage is a global problem. The U.S. is not an exception. Um, there's little data on this in the U.S. And so in 2011, Tahere conducted a study, a survey on forced marriage and immigrant communities in the United States. And it received over 500 responses from 47 different states. And the survey found that as many as 3,000 known or suspected cases of forced marriage in the U.S. that occurred over a, a period of just two years. And about two-thirds of the respondents to the survey stated that they felt there were hidden cases in their communities that weren't coming to the attention of service providers. So that indicated that this number really is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and Tagore's survey found that forced marriage affects families of many diverse backgrounds and faiths. And service providers identified people who had been subjected to forced marriage from at least 56 different countries of origin. Most frequently mentioned in the survey were India, Pakistan, Mexico, Bangladesh, the Philippines, Afghanistan, Somalia, and Yemen. However, almost every region and continent in the world was represented with individuals reporting cases involving families from Russia, China, El Salvador, France, Bhutan, as well as uh, within multi-generational American families. Uh, so as you can see, the religious backgrounds of those affected was also incredibly diverse and included those from Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, Jewish, and other backgrounds as well. The survey found that the majority of forced marriage victims in the U.S. are female, but some are male. And although forced marriage is a gendered problem and women and girls are most effective, um, Tahiri does see male clients, and this is consistent with data for other countries. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, about 21% of callers to the National Forced Marriage Unit hotline were male in 2014. Forced marriage impacts people of all age groups. Um, in their work, Tahiri has served clients as young as 12 and those over the age of 50 and people with a range of immigration circumstances in the United States, including United States citizens, lawful permanent residents, and other visa holders. And um, important to note that the marriages can happen in the United States and abroad, and that those threatened with travel face increased risk of isolation from health and a lack of rights and protection. And we'll talk about that risk a little bit more later in the webinar. So another common question is, why would anyone force someone into a marriage? Um, and the truth is that the answer to that question is often quite complex. The motivations in each case vary and they're often numerous and intersectional. In short, there's often no one reason why a forced marriage happens. Um, and so what we've tried to do with this slide is illustrate how community level and societal level factors that are present across cultures and communities are just some of the root causes for why forced marriage exists as a tool of power, control, and oppression, and then to relate those root causes to individual and family level triggers that can be the case-specific impetus for a forced marriage for a particular individual. So what do these cases look like? 
I want to take a moment to share two different case vignettes with you to give you a sense of how a forced marriage case might manifest in practice. So I'm just going to read these two different stories. Um, the first involves Aria, who is 16 years old and a United States citizen whose parents immigrated to the United States when she was five. Aria's parents exercise a great deal of control over her and her siblings' lives, forbidding dating and requiring she come straight home when school lets out. Aria also has a part-time job at a local store, but she has to give her parents her work schedule every week and make sure she is home within a half an hour of her shift ending. Her parents also monitor her and her siblings' computer and cell phone use very closely. Thank you. Aria's parents have always, um, let's see, okay, thank you. Aria's parents have always told her that they would arrange her marriage, and recently they informed her that they have found a good match and want to travel to their home country over summer break for the wedding. Aria has repeatedly told her parents that she is not ready to get married, but her family insists the marriage must go forward now. Her parents have told her that if she does not marry the man of their choosing, she will bring shame to the family and that her refusal to get married is killing them and ruining her younger sister's marriage prospects. Although her parents have never used physical violence against her, she did witness her older sister being beaten after she fled the home she shared with her abusive husband and tried to return to the family home. Her sister was also resistant to the marriage their parents had arranged for her, but ended up giving in to family pressure. Aria does not want to end up in the same situation as her sister, but does not know how to safely resist the pressure to get married. And so our second case example involves Rachel. Rachel was born in the United States and raised in a very isolated religious group and homeschooled most of her life. At the age of 15, her mother arranged to marry her to a man more than twice her age and insisted that this was what God wanted. Even though Rachel begged for her mother not to marry her so early to a man she hardly knew, Rachel's pleading fell on deaf ears. At one point during a particularly emotional fight, Rachel's mother slapped her across the face. After that, Rachel simply tried to keep her head down and ignore her mother as much as she could. But being so isolated from the outside world and seeing most people around her being married at young ages, Rachel felt trapped with no one she could safely talk to about her desire not to get married and her fear of what would happen to her once she was married. Ultimately, Rachel felt she had no way out and no choice but to go along with the marriage. She spent several years trapped in an abusive marriage to a husband who prevented her from completing her education, with whom she had several children before finally getting the help she needed from a counselor and finding the courage to leave her marriage. She is now estranged from her family and community and rebuilding her life on her own. So we'll keep those two examples in mind, and I may come back to them um, as we talk through some of the legal remedies that we'll cover today. And hopefully this introduction to the problem of forced marriage in the United States has given some context that helps to frame our consideration of civil protection orders as a legal remedy to prevent forced marriage. And this webinar presumes that you all have some level of familiarity with the civil protection order remedy. So I'm not gonna spend much time explaining it, but I do wanna give just a bit of background to ensure that we all have a basic shared foundation. So what I'm calling civil protection orders are referred to by many different names in different states, sometimes protection orders, restraining orders, um, but the basic elements of the remedy are the same. They are civil legal remedies available in the civil system um, as opposed to protection orders that also sometimes can be available on the criminal side. Here we're focusing on the civil remedies. Um, and they result in a court order that can be enforced in either civil or criminal proceedings. Some common provisions include orders to stay away from the petitioner, to limit or prohibit contact um, from the respondent directed at the petitioner. And many civil protection orders contain additional provisions that prohibit the respondent from engaging in other types of conduct or require the respondent to engage in certain types of conduct. And some states have multiple types of these orders. My, most of my analysis today is gonna focus on the um, initial form of civil protection orders that were adopted across the US, which were meant to address domestic violence. So when I'm using the term civil protection orders, that's generally the context I'm thinking of. 
many states have adopted additional types of protection orders um, to deal with other problems related to gender-based violence. Um, some of the most common include sexual assault protection orders or protection orders that are specific to stalking. Um, some states also have a separate remedy of child protection orders. These are often available in, uh, through the abuse and neglect system, and these can provide an alternate avenue for relief for minors who are subjected to forced marriage and other forms of abuse. Um, but child protection orders, as well as other avenues of relief through the abuse and neglect system, child custody um, proceedings or guardianship proceedings, all of those are beyond the scope of what I'll cover today, but I wanted to flag them for you as alternative potential avenues of legal relief and just let you know there may be a future webinar on those topics to look forward to at some point. Um, benefits of civil protection orders and um, why they drew my attention um, and I know um, the attention of Tahir and others working on the issue of forced marriage um, are several primary things. One is that they provide emergency relief uh, for someone who is facing a form of abuse, including forced marriage. Um, secondly, they offer individual control over the process, and this differs from the criminal justice system. So when the criminal justice system responds to, for example, an incident of domestic violence, the person who's been subjected to that violence is a witness in the case. The state controls whether the case is brought, how the case is presented, uh, what penalties are sought as a result if a conviction or guilty plea is secured. And although the state um, may and may be obligated to confer with the person who was subjected to the abuse along the way, the ultimate control is out of that person's hands. In the civil process, the person who experiences the relevant conduct is in total control of the process in terms of when the case is brought, how the case is presented, and whether it's pursued to a final order and what remedies are sought in the end. Another key benefit can be that a person can secure court intervention in a situation where someone feels they need protection without necessarily involving criminal punishment. These are civil remedies and um, they are entered initially without any criminal consequences. It's only if there's a violation of the order that criminal penalties might kick in. Now underlying conduct that could lead to the issuance of a civil protection order often could be subject to criminal penalties, but filing for a civil protection order does not have a criminal consequence on its own. And then a final key benefit of civil protection orders uh, in this context is that remedies can and are meant to be tailored to the needs and desires of the petitioner in a particular case. And so in my research, I did a deep dive into the protection order statutes of all 50 states in the District of Columbia and really tried to analyze them through the lens of a forced marriage circumstance and evaluate the viability of protection orders as a remedy to prevent a forced marriage. I want to say at the outset, I think they also potentially could be useful um, to intervene in a forced marriage once it's occurred and help someone escape. But my analysis was really focused on their viability as a preventive tool. And my ultimate conclusion is that um, civil protection orders show promise as a tool to prevent forced marriage in most states. Many challenges arise in doing so, but it's possible. And I think that the remedy should be considered by advocates who are working to assist people um, to escape from these circumstances and that law reform should happen to make the remedy even more viable. And we'll get to all of that later. Uh, but for now, um, I've identified four main determinants of the accessibility of protection orders within a particular state and their utility for preventing forced marriage. And I'll walk through each of these in much more detail, but so you know what's coming. The four major determinants I identify are the qualifying relationships within a statute, the qualifying conduct that needs to be shown to secure relief, any impediments that arise uh, if a petitioner is a minor, 
and then the remedies that are available under the statute. So first, qualifying relationships. So one's eligibility to seek relief under a particular civil protection order statute depends upon the relationship between the petitioner seeking protection and the individual who is alleged to have caused harm to that person. It's defined most often by the relationship between the parties. Um, sometimes it's defined with regard to the crime, regardless of the relationships that the parties have. And states vary widely as to what relationships qualify. Key relationships for the forced marriage context include parent-child, household members, other relatives, stalking, so there's one of those crime-based relationships I mentioned, and then also engagement relationships in particular. And the key, one key challenge with regard to this determinant of accessibility of protection orders is that the protection order statutes um, sometimes focus on intimate relationships and don't cover abuse within the broader family or covered under more limited circumstances. So for example, parent-child being one of the critical relationships in the forced marriage context, there's a wide variation in the availability of protection orders between parents and children. Um, in some states, they're only available in this context if the child is an adult child. Um, sometimes there are requirements that the parent and child must live together um, and or must have lived together at some point. And some states require the opposite, that it's only available if a parent and child have not lived together. So there are a wide range of permutations here. Um, household members, in some states, household members must share an intimate relationship to qualify. So that's something to be looking out for in particular states. And there's also a wide variation in the other relatives that may qualify for protection. Some states cover only a, a narrow range, such as grandparents. Others cover a broad range, such as anyone related by blood. States also vary as to whether relatives must share a household or have shared a household at some point to be able to qualify for protection order relief. So the second major determinant of accessibility of protection orders is the qualifying conduct. And this is the acts that justify the issuance of a protection order. In many states, um, these are limited to criminal offenses. Um, and in all states, acts or threats of physical violence will qualify for relief. Stalking or harassment qualifies either for the domestic violence protection order remedy or alternatively for a separate stalking protection order remedy in most states. Emotional abuse or coercive conduct qualifies in only some states. It's only a much smaller number of states, for example, that cover emotional abuse. And also something to look out for and, and that might pose a challenge is that some states impose time limitations as to when a qualifying act must have occurred. The criminal focus that is very common to protection order statutes is significant because Tagore's 2011 survey found that the most commonly reported tactics of those attempting to force a marriage would not themselves justify the issuance of a protection order. Um, and similarly, acts that constitute criminal offenses were not the primary means of coercion used in either of our example cases. In the case of Rachel, if you might recall, she was slapped by her mother, which might qualify her for relief. Um, but there may be a question that could be raised as a defense as to whether the mother's conduct was reasonable parental discipline um, and not criminal in nature, not assaultive. And um, Aria suffered no direct physical harm by her family members. So in her state, access would depend on the court's understanding of forced marriage itself as a threat to harm her, and perhaps based on uh, what she witnessed happen to her sister as an implied threat as to what could happen to her in the future if she refused. So it would be a more tenuous connection and re would require a lot of expert advocacy to persuade a court why the conduct posed a threat, much less clear cut. Um, even in states that recognized emotional abuse for both of these case examples, uh, a court might find it challenging to navigate which of the parents' conduct alleged 
constitutes abuse and which of it instead was misguided, perhaps, uh, parental efforts to get a child to do what a parent sincerely believed was in the child's best interest. So just a lack of clarity there that could be pretty challenging. Um, and just as a general matter, stalking or harassment, I think, poses similar challenges, though may not be impossible in different cases if a good record is built. Um, but the challenges that can be posed in proving stalking or harassment are that typically one must demonstrate that the actor intended to cause fear or emotional distress, which again can get murky in a parent-child case if a parent sincerely believes he or she is acting in the child's best interest or is just parenting. Um, child endangerment can be another ground that could qualify for the issuance of a protection order in some states. And um, I found in my research at least one case, it uh, was from New York, that sustained a conviction against a parent for playing an act, for child endangerment, for playing an active part in marrying a 13-year-old daughter to a 17-year-old. So there's, although limited, there is court precedent for making this connection of forced marriage as child endangerment. Okay, a third major determinant of how accessible protection orders are to address forced marriage in a particular state address uh, entails the impediment, what I call the impediments of minority. So because of their legal status, special rules govern minors' ability to obtain civil legal relief. They must have standing, both the right to seek relief as a party in the case, and they also must have legal capacity, which is the right to file and pursue the case on their own behalf. Um, or if they don't have legal capacity, they must have a qualifying adult representative who can bring the case on their behalf. Um, states vary widely on these issues. And I should say that um, if you have this come up in your work and you're looking to investigate what the law is on your state, just be aware that it's governed not only by the protection order statute at play, but also um, case law might come into play, court rules, and some states where um, the other authority is vague, bench books have certain directives as to how courts should handle cases in domestic violence, uh, civil protection order cases in particular involving minors that might be useful to look at in the forced marriage context. So um, some states explicitly grant both standing and capacity to minors to seek protection orders. Some grant standing but not capacity some explicitly deny standing, and many statutes are ambiguous on one or both of these issues. Where statutes are unclear and say nothing about minors, there's a strong argument that they should have standing. And this is because under the law, minors are persons just like adults are, and they have legal rights that deserve remedies when they're violated, just as adults do. Um, likewise, where statutes say nothing about minors' capacity, um, depending upon the court rules uh, in a particular jurisdiction, there may be an argument that minors should be able to represent their own interests, particularly if the jurisdiction follows Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 17C, because 17C gives courts broad discretion to make any order to protect the interests of a minor party in a case, and case law establishes that that discretion encompasses an order that a minor can represent her own interests in a proceeding or may proceed with counsel and without another representative adult. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of, that it may be possible if you're working with a minor who doesn't want to tell anyone about what's going on to her but wants court intervention, it might be possible for her to proceed alone. Where a minor cannot or does not want to represent herself in a case, um, then you must determine which adults could qualify to bring the action on her behalf. And many jurisdictions that speak to minors in protection order cases limit the adults who can seek protection orders on their behalf. And the most common limitation is to limit this group of adults to household members. Um, the requirements probably are meant to ensure that parents or other adults that are actively involved in a minor's life participate in and are aware of a minor's decision to seek legal relief. But the problem in the forced marriage context is that it may be these very same adults that the minor needs restrained. And so, um, at least on its face, the statute would then only permit those adults 
who need to be restrained to bring the minor into court to begin with, which could be a huge barrier. Other states designate the adults broadly and leave it to court discretion to decide who's appropriate. So some states will designate any appropriate adult can bring a case on behalf of a minor. And still others um, list specific adults, but may include broader categories, such as program staff from domestic violence organizations, representatives of state agencies, or prosecutors. So I want to, um, I feel like this has been a lot of information in the abstract. And so I've um, put together a couple of slides with just a few representative states examples and how these might play out. And I selected these slides just to illustrate for you that there's a real range between states and within particular states of how accessible protection orders are in the forced marriage context. And people often ask me which state's protection order statutes provide the best response to forced marriage. And I found this question really difficult to answer because there are so many factors involved and they often vary so widely. So I found it helpful to turn to specific examples instead. Um, so the District of Columbia statute is one that stands out to me as being um, more accessible in the forced marriage context as it's currently written. And that's because it has a broad range of qualifying relationships. Um, it includes parents and children, both minors and adults. It includes household members, um, any relatives related by blood or marriage those in dating relationships, and those related by stalking. It does not include engagement relationships, um, but in the family and household realm, it's quite broad. It also has a somewhat broad range of qualifying conduct. So it must be criminal in nature, non-criminal emotional abuse is not covered, um, but any crime that is committed against a person qualifies. And this has been interpreted by courts to also include property crimes if they were done in a way that um, put personal safety in danger. Uh, the district is also one of only nine um, jurisdictions in the United States that currently criminalizes forced marriage under very old laws that are almost never used, but its criminal forced marriage statute arguably could provide a basis since any crime against a person qualifies. And then finally, with regard to minors, the District of Columbia statute provides minors full standing and also grants minors who are 12 and over legal capacity to seek protection orders against dating partners and 16 and older legal capacity to seek protection orders against any qualifying relationship on their own. And if someone would want an adult to bring a case on their behalf, any appropriate adult may represent them. Another example of a jurisdiction that um, also shows strong promise in the forced marriage realm is Illinois. Again, there's a broad range of qualifying relationships that are pivotal in the forced marriage context, including parents and children, household members and relatives. It also covers engagement and there's a separate remedy that covers stalking. Qualifying conduct is particularly broad. Um, it includes physical abuse, harassment, also interference with personal liberty and willful deprivation of necessities. So, those are grounds not found in many states that may more readily apply to the tactics more commonly used in forced marriage. And for my, minors are clearly given full standing. The legal capacity, at least under the statute, is a bit unclear. It may be more clear to those of you who practice in Illinois and see how the courts handle this. But it is clear that any adult can seek protection on a minor's behalf. Arkansas is an example of a state that's less protective for a few reasons. Um, it has a, a decent range of qualifying relationships, including, importantly, parents and children. But the qualifying conduct, as you see, only includes acts or threats of physical violence. So here, recall um, that um, both Rachel and Aria might have a harder time qualifying. Minors do have standing, but they don't have capacity. And it, the statute explicitly provides this is true even if the minor is married. And um, so they only may file if an adult brings the case on their behalf. And those uh, uh, who are empowered to bring a case on their behalf include only adult family or household members or domestic violence program employees. So given whom a minor is likely to be filing against in this circumstance, to have access realistically, a minor would need to get herself to a domestic violence program and get someone there to file on her behalf to 
have access. Oregon is another example of a less protected state. Um, the qualifying relationships include relatives and household members on the positive side, also in stalkers through a separate remedy. Um, the, but most of those are only for adults. Minors only have standing against sexual partners and spouses. So if we're looking at this remedy to prevent a forced marriage, those probably are not going to be helpful to a minor facing this problem. Qualifying conduct is limited to causing bodily injury, creating fear of bodily injury or sexual assault, and it has one of the time frame requirements that I mentioned. Um, and that the time frame um, and the requirement to show imminent danger could be problematic in forced marriage if the person fearing a forced marriage is not given information about exactly when a marriage will occur. So that may be a particularly difficult element to overcome in this context. Okay, and then I have one more example for you. If I can change the slide. Katie, are you able to help me? Thank you. Okay, the final example is South Carolina. Um, the qualifying relationships that would come into play for forced marriage, um, spouses, so only after the fact, and household members. Um, stalking is also a, a qualifying relationship through a separate remedy. And the qualifying conduct is limited to physical harm, threats of physical harm, or sex offenses. Minors have full standing. The legal capacity is unclear, and only household members may file on their behalf. So similar challenges to statutes we saw earlier. So another less protective state. So I hope these examples have been helpful to give you a sense of kind of the range of how all of these factors may play out in different jurisdictions. And so it really requires kind of a detailed calculus as to whether and under what circumstances someone facing a forced marriage will be able to proceed. And before so, we move on from the grounds of relief that must be established to talk about the fourth major determinant of remedies, I wanted to just stop here and share a practice tip. Um, some of the things that Tahiri found to be effective in conveying the threat of forced marriage in court filings. As courts may not be cognizant of the problem of forced marriage in the United States, it might be surprised to see it presented as grounds for civil protection order relief as this is a novel use of this remedy. Um, here are some ideas for how to structure a petition um, to make it more informative. So one is to think about educating the court as you're advocating. Just having in your mind that this might be completely new information to a court that forced marriage is a problem in the United States. So really thinking about how to tell that story and make it persuasive. You may to do so, you may want to make the petition um, even more detailed than you ordinarily would. Um, you may also consider um, attaching supporting affidavits or being prepared at least to bring witnesses who can speak about the traditions and past practices within a particular family, community, or culture that are coming into play here. Um, and you may also want to uh, think about how to give context to demonstrate why conduct that may on its face not seem threatening or not typically what the court would expect to see if it's looking for a threat, uh, but to connect the dots to why it is threatening and distressing in the context of someone facing a forced marriage, even if it's not clearly violent. Thank you, Lisa. So we have an interesting question that I wonder if we can pause for a second and take quickly. So we have um, an advocate who says that in the qualifying acts of domestic violence in Arkansas, they have the fear that physical harm, bodily injury, or assault is about to happen to you. Mm -hmm. And the question asker is wondering if there's something missing from that statute. And I know that you probably don't have the 50 states memorized, but I did just want to, before we move on to the next topic, uh, let you know that that was a question that was posed. Um, I I don't have the exact statute right in front of me, so I don't know that I can respond to that right now. Um, Is yeah. the answer to that or possibly more information that would be helpful in answering that in the paper itself? Um, yes, you could look to the paper right. itself and also womenslaw.org has yeah, a that's good where she... summary of protection order statutes in every state. Yeah, that's where she got the language. 
the where the question asker pasted. So just wondering if that fear of potential bodily harm that is about to happen. Um, to me, it feels like a space where creative lawyering could happen, depending on the people who are making you feel that way and the qualifying like people in that state when it comes to getting a PO. Does that sound right to you? Um, yes, and I guess I guess. Um... So I'm not able to answer the question right now of exactly what sure. that statute says, but it seems consistent with requirements in um, have been describing that most states require either physical abuse or a threat of physical abuse um, of some kind. And the key there, I think, is persuading a court that the threat of a forced marriage itself or the threat of what a family might do to someone who resists the forced marriage is real and convince you know uh, educating the court about what has happened in the past to make this person believe that bodily harm in the form of some kind of physical assault for example to be likely if she resists a marriage so in our case example of aria that she saw that happen to her sister that she plans to resist a forced marriage herself. And so she fears that the same kind of attack that her sister suffered, she also will suffer, might be a story to tell. And um, I think another tactic might be to argue that the bodily harm the person fears is in within the marriage, that they may be subjected to rape, for example. Um, I think those are all difficult dots to predict how you know whether a court will connect them in a particular case but those are some of the arguments that i would make if your statute requires you to demonstrate that physical harm has been suffered or will result in the future or is threatened i hope that Thank helps you. does that answer the question yeah and so the question asker is actually an attorney with women's law and i've offered to just connect you guys after the webinar if that's all right um great i figure that's lawyers connecting with other lawyers is always a good thing um, yeah. And then we had another question asker really quickly um, about resources that can help explain or advocate around, you know, country conditions and traditions and, and things like that. Um, the educating as you advocate and, you know, not having an expert witness, particularly available in the Denver, Colorado area. And so what I would point to there, and Lisa, you can chime in as well. Um, is our website preventforcemarriage.org has an overseas country map. And if the country of origin where the family is from um, is on that map, you'll find a memo uh, with a basic overview of customs and traditions and law with links to lots of different reports that are provide country conditions information. Girlsnotbrides.com is also a really good resource for all different countries where there is data on forced and child marriage. Um, they have reports and, and experts listed there as well. I think um, if you're ever looking for that kind of thing, coming to Tahere first is a, is a great start, or to Lisa, if she's the kind of resource that you're looking for. But there are lots and lots of documents out there that are written by groups like Sautietu or Manavi or Tahere and others that talk about the incidences, um, the rates and the dynamics of forced marriage in lots of different communities, if that's the type of thing you're looking for. And with that, I will hand it back over to you, Lisa. Thank you. Okay. I, Casey, can you please switch the slide to remedies for me? Thank you. All right, so the fourth and final determinant of the accessibility of a protection order statute to address forced marriage is um, lies within the remedies that the statute makes available once a civil protection order is entered. Um, and depending upon the type of protection order, and particularly for the domestic violence protection orders in a jurisdiction, a wide range of remedies is often available. Um, these remedies are not always a precise fit since they were meant to address domestic violence and um, not forced marriage. One thing, key remedy to look for though, is what I call a catch-all provision. So language such as that the, you know, directing that the court may direct the respondent to perform or refrain from other acts appropriate to the resolution of the matter or something similar um, allows courts creativity in addressing circumstances within a particular case. Um, and other types of orders may have more limited relief. So knowing 
depending upon the type of conduct you'll be proceeding on um, which remedy the person might pursue, uh, which type of protection order the person might pursue, it's important to look at the remedies available to see if they match that person's goals. So what remedies might be partic particularly important in the case of a forced marriage? So looking back to our example that we've um, kind of kept at the forefront today of a parent for forcing a child, and particularly a child that still lives in the family home, some of the important remedies will all be aimed at one primary goal, uh, maybe, uh, of restricting parental conduct without requiring a child to leave the family home. Because um, often, at least in, in much of the work that Tahere does, they've found that the children facing forced marriage want to remain with their families, they just don't want to be married. And so if that's the goal of a particular child, some remedies that a court could enter in the context of a protection order could be things including requiring a parent to turn in a child's passport to a court, to prohibit foreign travel, prohibit whatever coercive conduct is going on that's distressing the child and making the child fear a forced marriage, prohibiting the organizing or facilitation of a wedding, and requiring a child to remain in school. So this kind of catch-all relief can be critical um, in, and really also um, effective in making protection orders be responsive to the problem of forced marriage. Okay, I mentioned earlier that um, there are some that criminal consequences may ensue from protection orders once they're violated. Um, and those and, and two other factors I think are important to keep in mind when working with immigrant clients who may be facing a forced marriage. So I'm gonna talk about each of these in turn. One major concern or consideration to have in mind is international travel. Um, the U.S. State Department's ability to intervene abroad varies widely according to country laws and policies regarding forced marriage and domestic abuse. And if taken abroad, someone facing forced marriage may lose access to travel documents that would allow her to return to the United States. Um, unlike the United States that has no exit controls, many other countries do have exit controls to leave a country, and minors may need parental permission, and in fact, the permission of both their parents to exit a country once they've arrived there. So they may become trapped in that country. Um, so the best strategy is often to aim to prevent travel. And that's why in the previous slide, um, some of the remedies highlighted as useful in protection orders are asking the court to take possession of a child's passport, prohibiting international travel, other things that can be done are requiring regular check-ins with the court or court-designated contact persons. And Tahereh's Forced Marriage Initiative website has country-specific information, as, as Casey mentioned earlier, for 38 countries regarding the resources available to those facing forced marriage and specific legal risks of travel given the local law. So that's a great resource to have in mind um, if you're working with someone facing this issue. A second major consideration to have in mind with immigrant clients facing forced marriages are the immigration consequences of protection order violations. So again, because protection orders are civil orders, they don't by themselves have implications for immigration status, but they may have a possible consequences um, after a protection order is entered if it is violated. Um, so if a court makes a finding that a civil protection order was violated, and the provision that was violated involves protection against credible threats of violence, repeated harassment, of bodily injury to the person for whom the protection order was issued, the respondent, so the person who violated, is removable. And a conviction for violating a protection order is not necessarily required to establish removability. The court just make a, must make a finding. So I think this distinction is important. And it, this just speaks to the need for close counseling of an individual who may be concerned about the immigration implications of a protection order for the person against whom that individual will be filing. The act of seeking a protection order itself and having a protection order entered does not have immigration consequences, but the individual could be um, at any time, which is always true, prosecuted for any underlying conduct that was criminal, um, by the state, and 
any conviction for underlying conduct might have immigration consequences depending upon the conduct involved in the charges. And a violation of a protection order um, that's found by a court can have immigration consequences. So it's, it's more of a step process and there have to be lots of intervening factors for uh, the connection to be made, but it is a possibility and one to be aware of and talk about with clients. A third major consideration to have in mind with immigrant clients is the presence of ICE at the courthouse. Um, increasing ICE arrests at courthouses um, and increasing news attention to them um, as they've increased recently may discourage those who are undocumented themselves or might seek to file against a family member who's undocumented from going to court at all. Um, and federal policy still discourages courthouse enforcement actions and provides specific protections for some groups. So um, ICE policy directs that ICE officers should generally avoid enforcement actions in courthouse areas dedicated to family law matters. The Federal Violence Against Women Act and Department of Homeland Security policy strongly discourage enforcement actions taken at protection order hearings, among other locations that are critical to victim safety. And policies also prohibit enforcement actions against individuals who might be eligible for victim-based immigration benefits, such as file visa petitions, U visas, or T visas, if those actions are based solely on information provided by the abuser, trafficker, or perpetrator of crime, or the abuser's family member. Um, and, but these written policies are cold comfort um, when publicized arrests that ICE is making at courthouses occur. People worry that the policies won't be enforced in their cases and won't protect them or family members. So if this is a concern, it's important to talk to local immigration experts um, and those who, who are frequently present at your courthouses so you can try to assess how much of a risk this might be in a particular case. Of course, you can never know with certainty. Um, and it's challenging in this time when you don't want to um, overblow the risk that this might be in a particular case, but we have to be realistic that there's certainly more, more than no risk that ICE could be present at a particular courthouse on a particular day. Okay, so um, my overall conclusion is that um, Although challenging I, to pursue, I think that protection orders should be considered a viable remedy for forced marriage. And I would encourage people to try to use this remedy to help people. Because of the alternatives that exist right now, I think protection orders provide one of the best paths to relief. The major challenges that I've summarized for you today, um, I think boil down to a few major things. Things. One is what I call shoehorning. Because protection order statutes were not created with forced marriage in mind, um, we're required to make a lot of permutations and arguments to make forced marriage cases fit into the current protection order paradigm, both in terms of the types of conduct we're alleging and the types of remedies that we're seeking and trying to make it fit this circumstance. Because this is kind of a new way to use these statutes, there's also some uncertainty involved. And what I mean by that is, um, as lawyers and advocates, we can't tell petitioners who would want to seek protection orders that we definitely will be able to secure the orders for them if this is a new thing that the court is considering. I think um, if you have expertise in doing this and you're willing to try, it's worth trying. But the uncertainty of whether the court will grant relief may give some concern and deter them from seeking it. Also, because protection orders aren't typically and haven't been in the past been used for forced marriage, there's a lack of awareness of the remedy as a viable option, most importantly to those who may be facing a forced marriage. They may not know there's any legal relief available to them. And because of that, and all the challenges we've talked through, access to this remedy really requires connection with someone who has expertise. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanna flag that there is an alternative model. Um, the United Kingdom has enacted a forced marriage protection order. And um, I think this is an effective approach because their forced marriage is the qualifying relationship. Anyone who's trying to force a marriage can be restrained. Forcing marriage, however it's done, is the qualifying conduct. 
both minors and adults can access relief, and the remedies available are really tailored to the problem of forced marriage. So that's something to consider advocating for in your jurisdiction. Existing protection order laws, I think, can be improved to better address forced marriage. Some of the key improvements include um, making sure that parents and children, both minor children and adult children, uh, can be qualifying relationships, also adding engagement as a qualifying relationship. Since if you're trying to prevent a forced marriage, it may be that the petitioner and respondent have no dating relationship history. It's also important to permit a broad range of adults to file on behalf of minors when they come forward um, and to extend standing and capacity to minors to bring cases, at least to older minors, to bring cases on their own. Finally, to better protect against forced marriage, protection order grounds, um, but also other things like uh, domestic violence, conduct grounds can be expanded to include emotional abuse, coercive conduct, um, and also forcing marriage itself. And that's something that Texas did this past year when it recently increased its lawful age of marriage. It also amended its protection order statute to include um, a type of child abuse, which is forcing or coercing a child to enter into marriage as qualifying conduct. So that may be one way to expand protection order statutes in this context. And then finally, including a catch-all remedy um, is very important in the forced marriage context. It's also quite useful in other contexts as well. So some of these reforms would help multiple groups. And finally, here are two resources I wanted to point you to. Casey mentioned a few others earlier. Um, but these are two that also stand out. The preventforcemarriage.org has lots of resources about forced marriage generally, and you'll also find some of the country-specific conditions there. And then womenslaw.org that we mentioned earlier for great summaries of protection order statutes in every state. Um, I welcome additional questions if folks have them now and haven't had time to raise them. Yeah, we have a few minutes left. So first want to say thank you so much, Lisa. That was incredible. He, really, really informative, even for me, someone who's been talking to you as you've been writing this paper and doing this research. And I want to open it up for anyone who's had a burning question and hasn't had a chance to type it in. I'll leave the question box open for another minute. And if nothing comes through, then we'll go ahead and wrap up. But given that you did a great job leaving time at the end, I did want to give people the chance to ask questions if they wanted to take a moment to do that. So just hang in there for a, a minute or so, and we'll see if any comes through, and then we'll wrap. So we had a question uh, just asking specifically about the Texas statute itself. And so there were actually three places where Texas law was amended. Uh, this last uh, legislative session as it related to our child marriage work. And so I can actually send those offline as a, with a link to the statute as well as to Lisa's paper. Um, I think that's coming from Jackie Bolden. So I can connect with you offline on that because, I, I again, I don't think Lisa has them all memorized off the top of her head. Um, I do happen to have the Texas st statute site oh. here. Go it. ahead then. Um, ahead. It's Texas Family Code section 71.004. So the definition of family violence includes abuse as defined by another section, and that section is 261.001. And um, that defines abuse, and subsection M in that definition includes forcing or coercing a child to enter into a marriage. Thank you, Lisa. I forgot that we had talked specifically about Texas prior to the webinar. Um, that was so, Yeah. Um, another great question from Nusrat, who is an advocate and a colleague of ours down in Texas as well. Is there any case law on a PO being granted for a forced marriage in the U.S. at this point that we know of? Not that I know of. I would love to see one if anyone has found one. And we have done research into this as well. And we, you know, as an organization, have represented in family court plenty of clients. And the only time that we got a petition that was meant to prevent a forced marriage, we actually didn't get it on the grounds of the forced marriage itself at all. Our family law attorney ended up morphing a next friend petition into a CHINS, a Child in Need of Services petition. And the judge was convinced that this child needed to be allowed to live separately from her parents 
in order to continue going to school and maintain her relationship in particular with her teachers and her counselor at school. And so it had very little, if anything, at the end of the day uh, to do with the threat of the forced marriage when it comes down to the legal decision that was made to put this child into the uh, child protective services system through a CHINS or a Child in Need of Services petition. Um, but we did start out trying to do a PO to prevent a forced marriage, but it just morphed um, into something that could get us the same result, but uh, with a different argument. And so as far as I know, and Jeannie Smoot, who is the attorney on our forced marriage project here at Tahare, we don't know of any specific cases where a PO has been taken out and it has been for the purposes of preventing a forced marriage, either for a minor or an adult. And I know that there are attorneys in New York who are really hoping that we'll be able to do a test case of this because their PO statute does include coercion and it seems sort of ripe for this kind of case. But um, as you might imagine, many clients do not want to engage with the court system at all, whether it's civil or criminal. So that's my long-winded answer to that question. I had, there was one more question about how to support the initiative in the states where you live. I would point you specifically to our Falling Through the Cracks report. And if you go to our preventforcemarriage.org website, you can search in the search bar for Falling Through the Cracks, and that will take you there. It's also in our top sort of slideshow slider bar. It's also at tahare.org slash childmarriage. All of our reports on child marriage in the U.S. are there. Um, if you want to get involved in addressing sort of the minimum age of marriage piece in your state, which is how we got the forced marriage protection order piece slipped into the Texas code, at least as far as it um, pertains to minors. And so we are trying to be a bit creative when it comes to amending protection order statutes and where we can get buy-in from the local DV community, um, whether it's for adults or for minors, um, we are finding creative avenues in. And so that report, Falling Through the Cracks, can give you a sense of what was done in Texas and how it was done. Um, and if you are a DV advocate or at a coalition in your state that's interested or already perhaps engaging in some protection order reform, and we might be able to talk about how to work forced marriage pieces into that, we would love to connect with you. So I don't know if Lisa, you wanted to add to that. Nope, you covered it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, in the interest of everyone's time, then I'm going to wrap up. Um, if we go to the last slide there, you'll see um, all of our office locations. And in the email with the evaluation form, you will all uh, get my contact information as well as Lisa's. And so we hope that you'll take advantage of that and connect with us and become part of our larger national network working on this issue. And a huge thanks again to you, Lisa. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone.